might set up my timer here so I get everyone out of time, out of here on time for lunch, hopefully. Um, I feel after listening to Paul speak and his, uh, his great humour that I should try and tell an Irish joke, but I've, uh, I've never heard any, so if anyone, if anyone knows any, please, uh, please jump up. Um, as John said, uh, I'm Dave Barry, I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Alpine Shire Council. I have a background in software development and prior to moving to Australia I ran my own software development company. Um, prior to that I was a Defence Forces officer but I did spend quite a bit of time working for Hewlett Packard in their what's called HPTC which stands for High Performance Technical Computing Division or their Supercomputer Division. And the reason I introduced that is Hewlett Packard is considered a pioneer of innovation and if I look back when I worked with them, which wasn't that long ago, a bit over 15 years ago, they had 5% of that global super, supercomputer market share. They now have 40% of it having ta taken over IBM and a range of other providers. And Hewlett Packard is founded on what they call the rules of the garage, which is they were founded in a, in a garage in Silicon Valley uh, by Hewlett and Packard. Uh, and they're the rules of the garage. I won't, I won't go through them. The one I like the best is make a contribution every day. It's third from the bottom. If it doesn't contribute, it doesn't leave the garage. And I guess sometimes I question local government how there are a few things that, that don't contribute and still leave the garage. Uh, maybe, maybe we could keep them inside and save ourselves a bit of money. Um, interestingly, while doing a bit of preparation uh, for this last night, I noticed innovation amongst countries. And, and Ireland just barely creeps into the uh, top 10 on that front. Uh, Australia sits about number 23 in the world and when I did a bit more looking into it, innovative countries tend to be very focused on technology and on um, creativity, which uh, I guess in, in other countries like Ireland, like the United States, they're very, very strong. Um, but most of all, what leapfrogs countries up this chart, and in my view, one of the biggest barriers to innovation in general, and particularly in local government that we'll talk more about, is the ability of that country to embrace failure. So do they see failure when you innovate as a good thing or a bad thing? And the United States is a really prime example of that, where failure is not seen as a, as a bad thing. Um, I think everyone's been hearing a lot today about revenue sources and uh, financial assistance grants and the likes. I know in the case of my council, it means a loss of $3.25 million at a minimum over 10 years if the financial assistance grants start to get re-indexed. Uh, in real terms, that's a 7% total loss of that revenue source over a 10-year period. So certainly difficult times ahead. And of course, at a state level, who knows what will happen with other funds like LGIP and country roads and bridges. The reason I introduced them is, is with all the doom and gloom going around, I'm certainly a firm believer that uh, we can help ourselves. And I'm sure there's a number of, probably most people in the room would agree with that. Um, we all have sustainability issues, or certainly smaller rural councils do, but I believe that we have great capacity through innovation and other mechanisms to actually be able to address those challenges. Um, I think innovation is often driven by technology, and I'll talk through a few projects in a minute that I see across the Northeast, some of which I've been involved in, that have all delivered sustainability uh, benefits. Or the word of the week that I hear Joe Hockey using all the time, um, efficiency, dividends. So uh, I used it with my council yesterday, so this is my new word of the week. We're going to be leveraging more efficiency dividends. I think it means saving money. Um, and. I was looking back at uh, one of those, at Jeff Kennett's uh, newsletter that he releases quarterly through CT Management, and I guess something that I've observed, and I've observed looking at our strategic resource plans, is for a long period of time we can see these challenges emerging. I can see it in the case of our council, and we're not unique, uh, that on average we underestimate our financial position four years ahead by 20%. So in other words, if we say we're going to have uh, $8 million in wage costs four years ahead, our actual wage costs are $10 million. And I've done some benchmarking across small rural councils, and in general, we have a very, very optimistic, rosy-eyed view of the future. But some of the things that Jeff has said recently in the, in the newsletter, um, I think you know, he's foreshadowing a few months out uh, what we all know to be true. So I guess there's always the question we've got to ask ourselves. Sorry. Technology. 
we've always got to ask ourselves, uh, do we do a little bit of this from time to time? Um, what I'll cover off on today is I'll talk through some projects that I see across the Northeast that I think are good examples of sustainability uh, and of innovation, uh, stealing them from varying different councils that surround Alpine Shire, so apologies in advance to Indigo and Tawong Shires for stealing your projects and using them as some case studies. Uh, then maybe reflecting a little bit on what, what makes innovation, what generates innovation within councils, and then finally perhaps how we can do it a little bit better and what holds us back on the innovation front. I'll move reasonably quickly through these projects. I don't want to dwell on them in any detail. Some of you will have seen some of these projects before, so apologies <coughs> to those that have, but there's a, a few new projects in the mix. Um, the first one, as, as John mentioned in the intro, is a project that uh, Tawong Shire developed, and I was fortunate to be part of, of that team when I was working over there on a project called Insight 360. It's a uh, GPS tracking product that keeps an eye on all of these uh, little guys we see on the screen in front of you. And what Taong realized is by knowing where your plant is, it goes a long way towards knowing not only where your plant is, but where your human resource spend is going as well. Um, I might do a little demo at the end of this, if, if uh, a live demo, if we have some time up our sleeve. But what you get to see is um, uh, this, that's the sort of interface that you get to track all the, the plant on. And the demo I've got teed up is I can show you the Director of Technical Services car at um, Tawang Shire traveling around today. And rest assured, I've already called him to make sure he isn't up to any mischief for the <laughs> CEO and the councillors. Um, not that he would be. <laughs> so this interface works on a, on a range of different levels, and I won't go into it in detail, but the, the reason that Tawang developed it was two reasons, from a cost viewpoint and having a local government specific solution that met the needs of local government, but primarily cost. I think oftentimes with innovation you have got to get in, you've got to do the hard yards, you've got to graft away things and, and reach uh, a good outcome. And the, the good outcome uh, for them is that firstly people in the office like the Director of Technical Services has absolute visibility of what's happening on the ground. Um, it has OHS and security benefits, but most of all, it has back office benefits. Uh, and I think that's something that we miss out on a lot of the time. Our overhead in our organization is about 60% of our wage budget. So 60% of our wage budget goes on things which directly don't contribute to outcomes. And that's, that's about par for the course, and that's also being optimistic. Um, I won't go down through all the, the detailed benefits of the product there, but I think it's a good example of innovation, it's a good example of doing things better, doing things faster, and saving money in the back office end of things. And it can also be used not only on plant, but it can be used on uh, things like rail trail counters and a whole range of other things like fuel bowsers. Um, another Taowong project that I'll, I'll talk about, uh, Taowong in 2006 was the first town in Australia, the town of Talangada in, in Taowong Shire, to have a wireless mesh across the entirety of the town. Now everywhere we go today, we've all got iPads and we can access the internet wherever we are. But this was in a pretty uh, 3G, 4G, iPad, uh, ubiquitous Wi-Fi era. And what that did is that gave them first mover status. It put them on the, on the um, map and it enabled them to secure a million dollars funding to roll out a bushfire monitoring camera network across the entirety of their shire. <coughs> One last one to steal from Taiwan. Um, Taiwan was the first council in Australia to package together a solar panel rollout program which at one point had uh, them with 0.1% of Victoria's population generating 10% of Victoria's uh, solar electricity. And that project's been replicated by a whole range of other councils, over 40 other councils. And I guess all of these projects tie together. When you, when you start on the innovation bandwagon, you introduce a culture of innovation within an organisation which I think um, We'll talk about a bit more. Uh, Alpine Shire, we've been fortunate enough to win two major awards, uh, one Asia Pacific Award and one Planning Institute Award for our BAL Plan app. For those of you with the bushfire management overlay in your municipality, you'll know that someone rocks up at the counter and says, I want to build here, and you tell them, yeah, go and hire yourself a planning consultant to interpret how the BMO impacts on your property. Not at Alpine Shire, someone rocks up, we say we'll make an appointment, we'll come out on site, We'll grab our iPads, we'll walk around, we can do on the app, which looks like that, your uh, bushfire attack level assessment at multiple locations on the site, press a button, 
It generates all the reports, the field reports, the sighting reports, the, the battle level reports. Um, an immensely detailed uh, app that, it, that we've put a lot of energy into and that we're, we're very proud of. On the back of that, we also have two other apps. We have an app that um, we use for our road inspections, so natively developed in-house, integrates with our GIS, and also we have an app that we use for our fire inspections. So we inspect every property very, very quickly in our municipality. Press a button on the iPad. If we want to send them a letter, we uh, press a button saying what sort of letter we want to send them. It all works seamlessly. And I think we all know in municipalities that uh, annual fire inspections don't typically go very well. I can assure you because of our app, it goes very, very seamlessly. So those three apps together, firstly, save our ratepayers money directly. Uh, they save us money. The way most people have dealt with the bushfire management overlay is to put on half a planner extra or bring in extra resourcing. And again, with fire inspections, we're spending less on ranger services. Um, I'll talk about this product here. It's Vend. It's a point of sale system. We've all seen point of sale systems, but this is from New Zealand, who are leading the the absolute global space when it comes to next generation uh, technology products. And the Vend product is something that we use at our swimming pools, our landfills, visitor information centres, caravan parks, on and on it goes. So historically, I'm sure any of us that are, are in senior management will ask for data and no one ever has the data. You know, it's in a spreadsheet somewhere that was there a few years ago that someone prepared and now they've left and it doesn't quite match up across the different transfer stations because we measure things different ways. I'm sure that resonates with, with people. Uh, right now, we capture, you rock up to one of our transfer stations, we capture the data directly. We're emailing out to about 80% of people an invoice and only printing invoices or receipts for 20% of people. When you make a sale, even if it's a sale on an account, it goes straight into our back-end system, the invoice goes out in the mail. But most importantly, it introduces fraud control for us, it gives us high quality data, and of course, it um, enables us to manage our revenue. Very quickly, we, had, uh, we noticed that our end of day uh, calculations for the point of sale system didn't add up. And we said, well, why doesn't, why doesn't it add up? What do you do? Just because you're doing it electronically now and not on paper doesn't mean that uh, and it shouldn't be any different. And of course, the answer you always get in these situations is something like, well, we just changed that figure to match this figure on the end of day report. Or we have an over and unders jar here that we sit under the, the table, and we take the money out of the over and unders jar, and then you try and get into a conversation about that's kind of giving away something for nothing, and that's probably not the business that we're in. Uh, we also realized that over 10% of our sales at our transfer stations were under $2, which is pretty horrific when you see people putting through sales for 70 cents because they're calculating in a way that the fee schedule wasn't designed to calculate things. So they're looking at a cubic meter of trees and saying um, there's a lot of air in there, we'll charge you one tenth of a cubic meter, which, you know, not the way it should be, absolutely no ill intent on behalf of anyone, but I think when you bring technology to bear, you quickly iron out these things and again, we introduce the back office efficiency. Uh, Tao Wong Char recently have introduced this particular project, and I think this is a good example. It's at their swimming pools, introducing automated turnstile entry for their swimming pools and vending machines. So what they're able to move towards is moving more people onto a lower cost season ticket. So their season ticket is $100 a year. At Alpine, our season ticket is $270 a year. They're able to do that because they can get people through the gate quicker and the reason being is, is, as we all realize, you take $2 off someone going into a pool, it costs you about $20 plus to take those $2 off. So what they've done is they've eliminated the labor resource associated with taking the money, which means you can reduce your <coughs> lifeguard costs by about 40%. You can increase your patronage, and you remove, for about 90% of the time, the requirement to run a kiosk in the pool. What's the loss of it all? People don't get to buy dim sims or hot chips. They have to go up the street to buy them afterwards. But I think, you know, in, probably in the case of Taiwan, maybe a thirty to forty thousand dollar a year saving as a as a smaller council um, is quite substantive, and it doesn't warrant forty thousand dollars of rate pairs funds to be able to sell dim sims, in my view. Uh, but that's that's a good example, I think, of simple automation that we see every day. And 
I mean, I must admit, I'm, I'm almost embarrassed talking about some of these things because if it was private enterprise, you'd go, oh yeah, sure, isn't that what you do? You get people in the gate as quickly as possible, <coughs> you take as much money off them as quickly and as cheaply as you can, and you try and give the best service for the lowest price. Um, I think something that Paul in the previous speech spoke about was engagement and communication, and I think this is something where we're, we're definitely lagging quite a bit behind. If we look at the quality that you'll get of customer service from a one or two man inter internet retailer in terms of being able to respond to your query, you knowing where it's up to in the queue and able to close off your queries, we're nowhere near that space and I don't think many councils are at the point that they're able to engage with people really well in a social media environment. Um, we started our Facebook page about six months ago we put a huge amount of energy into it, paid advertising. Uh, probably the most significant thing we do is we extract data from all of our varying different databases where we, where we capture email addresses. We're then able to build custom audiences. So for example, we're able to target people that we know go to the gym with specific messages on Facebook. We can target different communities with specific messages, different age groups based on bringing Facebook and our own existing data together. And I guess the proof of the pudding is there. We have, I think, in overall likes, we are the fifth highest council in Victoria. Uh, Bendigo, I believe, is the highest. Uh, Bendigo's got 1,900 likes odd, and we've got 1, 000, just over 1,100. So we've got about 60% of their likes, but of course, they're about eight times our size. So we're going pretty well six months in. Uh, and here's an example of a post. Here's an example of how we can do something different as a result of, of social media. We wanted to run a free pool day. Well, previously, we couldn't have done that. How could you get a message? How could you say it's going to be hot on Friday? We're going to write to every rate pair. We're going to spend three grand getting a mail out done. Impossible. This post reached uh, 12,500 people, as you see here. It was liked 203 times. It was shared 150 times. And most of all, it got 24 comments. And believe it or not, every comment was positive. No one could. Uh, we, were, we were betting that one person would have a negative, you know, like I've paid my season membership or whatever it is. But uh, absolutely fantastic. Our patronage in the pool went up. We made greater profit out of the kiosk. It was, a, it was an absolutely uh, fantastic day. Immensely positive feedback and something we could decide on a Thursday afternoon to roll it out at 4 o'clock and have the free day <coughs> the following day. Interestingly, that was January the 15th. And it's amazing how great minds think alike because our adjoining council in Wangaretta on the right on January the 16th had um, exactly the same idea as ours, even down to using the same wording, the same idea around the signs and the same standing on the pools. So um, some people might call it a bit of plagiarism, but we think it's just mere coincidence. Um, I think... Across the, the Northeast, and I'll come to it in a second, there's uh, been a range of collaborative projects funded by the state government. One of them is a business improvement manager, uh, funded out of what, what used to be the sustainability accord. And effectively, this is just good old fashioned demand reduction, getting your head around the data, understanding what, you, um, what you're spending and where. And here's an example of something that, that this particular person uncovered. He noticed that in the cases, this is Taiwan Shire, 80% of their supply charge, which is about $6,000 a year, had zero water consumption. We're talking about water here. So they're spending about $6,000 a year on a water supply pipeline, and no water is being used out of it. And of course, you do the investigation, and you go through you know, the why, why, why questioning, and people tell you, well, um, in a drought, they determine not to use the water, and the drought comes and goes, and people have developed alternative mechanisms to be able to water those particular uh, nature strips. So across the board here in this simple demand reduction exercise it was a 30% saving and particularly across utilities that's very very important because utilities water is growing at I think about 15% per annum in, in raw costs so um, saving money on utilities is very very important. Again this is a similar exercise that's been done across a whole range of things, bank charges, fleet com radios. My experience is every time you look at something in detail and you squeeze every penny out of it um, I haven't come across an example yet that you get less than 20% of a saving, and normally it's more like 30 or 40%. So the unfortunate message that I would have, um, having looked at a small sample of organisations in the Northeast, uh, but, but three councils in particular, is there is scope if you put the effort in 
to analyze every component of the business and we do let small things get away and of course if they are recurring spend, a uh, 1% rate increase for Taowong is $60,000. Uh, so every 30, 40, 10 grand adds up and um, it's very, very easy to, to make those recurring spends matter and uh, it's something certainly that, that I think we all focus a lot is, is that year in, year out, out spend. And of course all of these outcomes are scalable, there's a whole range of examples. And probably the final innovative project across the Northeast, and I'm, I'm flying through them, but I'm hopefully painting the picture that we're, uh, like most councils, trying to work together and, and do things as innovatively as possible, is a shared service between Indigo and Tawang Shire. So if you ring Indigo Shire at the moment, um, they'll say we're transferring you through to your rates department, someone will answer the phone and they'll say hello Indigo Shire, you're actually talking to someone in Tawang Shire in Talangada. There's a, a whole history about why that came about, but it was effectively around being able to, one, one entity having a particular expertise in that area and therefore being able to deliver the service more efficiently. Um, even down to them using the same rates notices, except obviously with some cosmetic logo changes. The rates notices are printed black and white in a single pass, no printing of stock. It all goes out, significant cost savings. To put it in context, if we were part of that arrangement as Alpine Shire, the cost to us to run our rates and property service would be $80,000 a year. Our current cost is $240,000 a year. And there's many examples of that. Obviously, lots of Where parties. Where do you join us? <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to talk about the hurdles and the challenges. That's, that's the only thing that's, that stops the answer to that uh, question. Yeah, like everything, it's, uh, it's a difficult exercise to bring services together. It takes a, takes a long while. Anthony McLean, uh, he's sitting at the back of the room here, he's a uh, manager, executive manager of business collaboration across five northeast councils with a particular focus on Indigo, Taowong and Alpine in terms of bringing services together. And even with the best of will in the world, I think it's fair to say that bringing one or two services together is a difficult but rewarding challenge. Um, having talked through all of that, I think we all know what enables innovation to happen, but it's probably, it's probably worth uh, maybe recapping, I guess, my views on it is firstly, to innovate, you have to have the customer at your core. You have to care a lot about the rate pair, because if you don't care, why would you bother innovating? Why would you bother innovating, doing things better, or cheaper, or faster? Um, and you have to have an environment of, of trust and autonomy, and uh, certainly I've been afforded that opportunity in the past, and I think it is something that all too often in local government because of the nature of our industry, it doesn't happen. Um, you know, we, we need to give people the power to experiment, the power to take risks, the power to fail. And then I guess, is local government an inherently curious type uh, uh, beast? When I talk with one of my uh, director colleagues at Indigo Shire, we often say that we could probably do our job if we were three or four year old children because you've got to ask why a lot. And I'm not sure that we ask why enough that we, that we question the status quo, but I think some councils uh, I do. And last, but by no means least, I think uh, you know, innovation is, is really, it's, uh, it's finding the solution, but it's also executing it. I guess that's the difference between creativity and, and um, innovation, and then having the belief to, to see it through. When I was in the Defence Forces, we used to say improvise, adapt, and overcome. Um, I'm not sure that we did much of it, but it sounds quite, it sounds quite good. And, uh, and the theory was, you know, where, where there's a will, there's a way. And, um, and I think uh, some of the challenges that we are going through at the moment will enable us to find that will. Uh, I guess we get to the, the difficult sort of slide here, which is, why don't we do more innovation in, in local government? And I, and I come back to a few points here, but there's probably three main points. The first of them being, we're risk adverse. It seems to be that we're, we're really happy to kind of have day-to-day -day stuff, not pan out as we anticipated, but as soon as you try and do something a little bit out here experimental, there is a number of people that are always standing there going, I ah, told you that wouldn't work. And I think our culture is such that it, it creates that, that belief. Uh, we, we don't do enough to say failure is, is good in my view. It scares people in the local government, it delays the pace of innovation, and it means it takes a lot longer to achieve things. 
The second reason I think we don't innovate is, is we're, uh, we're too busy. We're probably doing a bit of this sort of thing, you know, too busy to, too busy to make improvements. Um, and I guess we all, we all know the Precios principle, 20% of your effort yields 80% of your results, and I think we can always do more to identify where to put our effort. Um, we don't do enough to challenge, this is the way we do things around here, and um, I'm sure we can all identify with that sentiment. And one that I've certainly noticed, I've been in the sector for 10 years, that I feel creeps in more and more, is losing our professionalism, losing our belief that as officers, that we're intelligent, smart people that can actually do things and make decisions ourselves. And I was, I was, uh, I guess, came across a situation recently within our organization where we had spent about $600,000 on, uh, on a day-to-day -day waste management consultant over the last four years, for, for, for good reason. But I guess you question, what does a waste management consultant know more than someone who takes the time to develop the expertise? And I'm one of those people that I don't think that the person that's sitting outside the window charging you 100 or 150 bucks an hour has any more answers than any one of us going home and taking the time to educate ourselves, unless it's a highly specialized area. Um, and I think the, the final one uh, that I'll touch on here. So for my mind, the, the biggest one is not embracing failure, and this is the uh, equal biggest, uh, is complexity. Uh, I mentioned what our overhead looks like in our organization, but I think the immense overhead and complexity that we bring into our business has a twofold impact. Firstly, it costs us money, but secondly, it stops us innovating. It makes things too complicated, and unfortunately, I have to say, it's my belief that we sometimes make things more complicated than they, they need to be. Uh, I'm not sure why, I can throw out some reasons. Maybe we think we're different. I see a whole heap of things that we do the same as private enterprise. Maintaining assets, managing finances. I don't see a whole hell of a lot of a difference. Um, I think sometimes it's easy for us because we don't have any commercial imperative and we don't see an immediate response to our, our actions. It's very easy for us to be a little bit inward looking and maybe to start to look more about what we're doing for ourselves than what we're pushing out there in terms of outcomes. And finally, I do notice that we tend to jump at shadows a lot. The number of times I hear, oh, the auditor said you have to do that, and you say, oh, where does it say it in the management letter? Oh, no, one of the audit staff said it when they were here. Well, you know, that's, I guess, thinking that things, thinking that there's an imperative to do things which perhaps don't necessarily exist and don't necessarily stack up in the scheme of priorities. And I could go through example after example of that. I look at things like time sheeting in our organization. Uh, we've got a $12 million wage budget. We time sheet about $4 million of that at a cost of about $150,000 a year. Well, if you look at the data behind that, guys are filling in time sheets every week, but they're filling them in exactly the same way as they've been filling them in for the last 10 or 15 years. So why not just take the last 10 or 15 years data? And if time sheeting's that important, that we want to get the true cost of a job, why are we only time sheeting one third of our overall wage budget? And we can go through a whole heap of things where I think you can, you can start to question and look at the root reasons why we do things, but sometimes I feel it's a lot of, we've always done it that way, and, um, and I think it's always worth asking why. Um, and I think we capture too much data. Uh, that's back to the complexity, and of course, what I notice is the second I ask for data, because we have such a complicated data capture, and I looked recently, I wanted some employee data. We were capturing 10,000 pieces of information across all our employees. 10% of that information was inaccurate, so the data was not usable. We've now refined that we're capturing 1,500 pieces of information, and we have highly usable data. Because I'm, I'm a bit of a believer in the, in the iPad world, that uh, you know, simple can be powerful, and we don't need a lot of complex, convoluted information to be able to make smart decisions. And the final thing that I think we overcomplicate is, um, is, and I'm a fan of spreadsheets, don't get me wrong, you can ask some of my colleagues. <laughs> um, we, we tend to over spreadsheet things. You know, we, everything becomes a formula and what we do is we disempower people from making good common sense decisions. We become so restrictive, so policy driven, so formula driven, that at the end of the day, people aren't empowered to just make a blindingly, blindingly obvious decision. And um, I've seen that recently where we've had to prioritize some projects. We developed this big framework. People sat around all day, prioritized it. At the end of the day, we discovered that the framework wasn't telling us when we put those projects out to people in the organization that we felt knew about the projects, 
the framework wasn't giving us the answer that we were anticipating. So ultimately, we came back to saying, hang on, we're smart people. We can, we've got a brain. We can factor in a multifaceted approach to project prioritization, and it doesn't always need to be scores in a spreadsheet. This is an interesting graph I came across on the notion of complexity. Well, since 1955, so 55 years, complexity in business in general has gone up by 6%. I think that's the word, complexity index. Six times, I should say. I don't think this is good English, but the complicatedness of that has gone up 35 times. So in other words, what we're saying is our businesses, every business has become more complicated, but our response to that complication has been multiplied, and the more it multiplies, the more we respond to that, and it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think in our sector, I'll come back to it, I think we have a lot of complication that we can, we can start to strip out, but it's difficult going to remove complication. Um, this is the sort of scenario that whenever you make change, everyone in the organization says it's going to happen. I don't think it happens very much, and in my view, you know, if it does happen, you recover from it. What, what else do you do? You don't, you don't make change because something might go wrong. So I guess my message is that, you know, keep calm and innovate. Um, in, case, in case you don't believe what I'm saying, here's an example of our wages over the last 10 years. Again, I've benchmarked this across other councils. This is our wages indexed against CPI, the wage price index, the local government cost index, the percentage of our materials and services, a whole heap of different things. Either way, it says our wage budget should be in about six and a half million dollars. Our wage budget is just over 10 million dollars. Very, very common across the sector. The interesting thing is if you look at rates, it's exactly the same thing. So we, if you look at our rates and you index them, it's the same for every council, we've all put up rates by about seven to eight percent on average every year over the last um, 10 years, and I know people say we haven't, but when you factor in rates, charges, municipal charges, everything else, the average is, is uh, about 8% growth in rate revenue across the state. Um, we've gone up above CPI, or above the local government cost index. So we're at this point in time generating, like most councils, $3.7 million more in, um, in rates than we would have had we just gone up with the local government cost index. And of course, the local government cost index is quite a high indicator. It's well above CPI and WPI also. Of that $3.7 million, $3.4 million has gone into our corporate overhead. $300,000 has gone into new services and delivery. And that's, that's a reasonably common pattern, and that's a direct response to what I would call complicatedness, my other new word of the week. Um, how can we do better is my, is my last um, slide. I think you probably picked up that I'm a fan of technology, and I reckon technology is a great driver of innovation, not just technology for technology's sake. But I think we're in the midst of a changing, well, I know we're in the midst of a changing technology paradigm. And I think if you look back to uh, the early 1900s when the Model T Ford came out, and everyone's going off buying their new motor car, I think we're still there saying, no, nah, we reckon these horses are going to be good for the future, we just need to feed them better. I think on the technology front, we're, um, we're on the wrong track. Uh, there's immense change in that space uh, in terms of web-driven applications, in terms of applications that give you fantastic power with minimal <coughs> complexity, and we all understand that from iPads. I think we all know what you can do on an iPad, which is a very rudimentary device. And the unfortunate thing is all of our legacy systems are designed around us. We've built them. We've built the Tech Ones, the Civicas. We've built them where when you onboard an employee, you need to fill out 50 different fields, many of them duplicated, many of them duplicated across different modules, because we think we have a need that we don't have. The issue is, most of the IT space at the moment is in this bottom quadrant here where people are deriving immense value from very, very low spend. And um, I think you look at iPad apps for a dollar or five dollars, you can get immense value out of some of them. But even up to modern accounting apps, and there's one that I talk about a lot, a product called Zero, who is gaining huge market share from, um, from Myob and others. That product integrates with all of these solutions, including the point of sale system that I mentioned earlier on. 
guess what I'm saying is I could go and set up a coffee shop down the street and I could immediately take credit card payments, I could have online time sheeting for my employee, I could have my accountant being able to access my files, I could have you ordering coffee on your iPhone, I could have you paying for it, I could have you knowing where you sit in the queue, I could provide a customer service service to you for probably 200 bucks a month, I could do it 10 times better than we can do for 100 grand a year and I could be a one or two man operation. Likewise, I can be an electrician in today's day and age, I can get jobs dispatched out to me on an iPad for 100 bucks a month. Uh, we can't do that to our outdoor crews. And the reason being is we're embedded in a legacy type solution. And what is quickly happening, sorry, just to look at the growth of some of these solutions, this is the zero product growth, 114% last year from 50,000 to 110,000 customers in Australia alone. Um, what's happening is, this is us. We're losing pace with technology, no doubt about it. But what makes it 10 times worse is everyone else is accelerating away from us and we haven't positioned ourselves to be able to leverage that technology. We're still there saying, no, we reckon the horse and cart is gonna see us through for the next 20 or 30 years. And making that step from what we're embedded in to modern solutions, in my view, is critical, but I think um, it's, a hard, it's a hard ask. Um, I might leave it there with a quote from this guy. I was looking at this, I'm sure he meant it about far more profound things than local government innovation, but uh, hopefully it has some applicability. Thanks, John. Firstly, I wholeheartedly agree with what you're saying, which is technology is an afterthought. It's the effort in resolving the, the inherent challenges. And my simple answer is with a lot of hard work. And I know um, Anthony, who's sitting down the back of the room, is doing that in relation to a harmonized procurement policy across three councils at the moment. Getting a procurement policy together forms the foundation to be able to go forward and deliver a harmonized purchase to pay solution, um, to be able to have better supplier onboarding, but I think Anthony will attest to every single step being an immense challenge. So I guess the answer is slowly and a lot of hard work. 